Number three, uh, I continue to use essential uh, investments. I use my, in, which edition is mine? Mine is the sixth edition, use the seventh edition. Uh, we begin with chapter, chapter two, which is financial securities. Financial securities are oftentimes simply called securities and usually for many economists the preferred term is financial instruments. Sometimes they're just called instruments. Alright, so section one is a fairly big section and section one is money market. Uh, the textbook has a lot of little terminological inconsistencies. Uh, this whole chapter is on financial instruments. And section one begins with money market. Uh, of course, money market is a uh, lousy mistake in a sixth edition. What we do is say money market instruments. All right, money market instruments. Why would they tolerate for six editions to say section one money market? Nobody would bother to notice. A market is a place where securities or other goods or services or any asset is generally traded. We don't want to study in this section money market, uh, money market. We want to study money market instruments. All right, so let's begin with the first one. So what is a money market? A money market is a market where money market instruments are traded. Then a money market instrument is a financial instrument which matures within a year or less. The first big one is treasury bills. Treasury Treasury bill. A treasury bill is a money market instrument. It is a liability. Now, guys, do you also want how about one point each for learning processes? All right. So, uh, treasury bill is a instrument issued by the government. In this particular case, is the U.S. government. So, it is a liability of the US government. It is usually has a maturity of less than one year. Most commonly it is a, has a maturity of one month, three months, or six months. All right, it is sold, one of the key characteristics is that it is sold at a discount. Discount means a reduction of the stated price. How do we call this stated price? Discount. No, discount is the reduction from that price. How do we call that particular price? Purchase price. Purchase no, purchase price, no. So, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's clarify. The purchase price is below that price. The difference between that price and the purchase price is called the discount. Huh? Okay, number one is car value. Really? used rarely or never used for government bonds, but technically it is called par value. We call it also face, face value, face value. And sometimes in a lot of European countries, uh, in British, they use the word nominal or nominal value. These three are the same, right? Yes, these three are the same. They're used interchangeably. Par value is usually used mostly for stocks. It is often used for bonds. Face value is the standard term. And sometimes in British English and a lot of European countries, they use nominal and nominal value. So discount is a discount from the nominal value. So the discount is discount becomes the difference between face value. Value and future, no, and the purchase price and the purchase price. So purchase price uh, actually is reduction 
from the face value and the reduction we call the discount, all right? The discount itself represents the investor's income, his own income. They trade it and for any security, not necessarily, this is again, pretty poor, very, very poor structure of the textbook, even though this is Bodhi, Kane and Marcus is amazingly the most common, the most popular textbook used in the whole world. 1993, 17 years ago, I studied from this textbook. And of course, didn't learn much from it. All right, so bid and ask. So, first of all, you have a bid, and then you have an <coughs> ask. So, bid is what you, the price that you're offering. A lot of times, is this related to T bills? That's my explanation of why the textbook is bad. It relates to a financial market for any security, for any asset, all right? For any asset on any financial market is related. You always have bid and you always have ask. And why and how they introduce it specifically for this is, you know, every security, as long as there is a market, there is a bid and there is an ask. Bid is essentially what you offer and ask is willing to sell. Yeah. Willing to sell. All right. So from this you get what is known as a bid price. No, first you get the bid price. So this is the price for which you have a bid. All right. You also have an ask price. Alright, so you're on the market and if I want to, so I am, per, you're the market maker, I'm on the market and I want to buy. If I want to buy, let's say, uh, US dollars, you will give me the, your ask price. So you're asking 376. All right, and if I have dollars, you're gonna bid or offer me how much? 374, correct, 374, all right. And the difference between bid and ask, in this particular case, point two, we call the spread. All right, so. The spread in this particular case is the profit or the gain, technically it's called the gain, of uh, the market maker for every time of buying or selling, bidding, you know, buying or selling a particular asset on the market. This is the benefit, the gain for which he will make the market. So, market maker. So market maker is a participant on a financial market which or who makes both a bid and an ask at the same time and for a maker is required by regulation at all times to have a bid and an ask. So you're going to be a market maker, you must be offering, bidding or asking at same time, meaning at all times, both of them. If you don't, then you're not market maker. You're market participant only, all right? So, market maker is a great privilege, all right? It's a great privilege. You can run it all the time or whatnot, but the privilege also has the responsibility to making the market at all times. Question? It could market maker could be a person, could be an institution. Usually is an individual who represents a particular major financial institution. Usually the market maker have two types. One is on in the pit, inside the pit, but that's now on how markets work, it's a whole different story. And another one is an electronic at any point in time, but I don't want to get into that. 
All right, so you have two types of methods to compute the return. The first is called the bank discount. Discount method. In other words, the treasury will be only for 30 days. So it's a 30 day treasury, it matures in 30 days, it gives you 0.2% return for that 30 days. Now you want to annualize and get your annual return. There are a number of methods. The first one is called the bank discount method, and the second one is called the bond equivalent method. Bond equivalent. Yes, the key is that the one uses 360 days, 360 days, we call this, how do we call the 360 days? We call it a bank year, a bank year, the alternative is 365 days, which we call in English, calendar. Alright, All right, let's see what else we have here on this chapter. Bid ask becomes a bid ask. So sometimes we call it spread, a lot of times we call it bid ask spread. Spread simply means difference between two values that are naturally related. So you have at least 50 different types of spreads in finance. So you can't just keep talking about spread, 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 because for a sophisticated guy like me, there are 50 different spreads. So in this particular case, when you say bid ask spread, there is never a confusion. In other words, spread is one of the most ambiguous words in finance. When you say bid ask spread, no one, you know, everyone will be perfectly certain exactly what you mean. All right, so this is how you compute it. So the next security we move on is a certificate of deposit. Certificate of, I'll shorten it, deposit, which is a CD. What is important to understand a certificate of deposit is a liability of a bank of a <laughs> Terminology, terminology, not only bank. Let's provide because no, here is a problem. Okay, let's clarify. Let's clarify a lot of terminology. Either, you know, uh, well, I understand a lot of times the textbooks are really lousy, so let's clarify what is a bank and see why it's not a bank. Then let's clarify a financial institution, see why it's not a financial institution, then come up with the right thing. So what is a bank? Bank financial institution. Yes, a mutual fund is also a financial institution. Pension fund is a financial institution. Insurance company is a financial institution. All right. Investment bank is a financial institution, etc., etc. So there are 15 different major financial institutions. So a bank is a, we begin, financial institution. Which or that? Number one, uh, makes loans, makes, makes, we add commercial loans, this is very important, it has to be a commercial loan in order to be called a bank, because it could be making mortgage loans, and a mortgage loan is an SNL, Savings and Loan Association, will be making uh, loans. Oh, sorry, mortgage loans. Personal accounts? Hmm? personal accounts? Yes. But, okay, the problem is personal account means nothing to me. And personal account means one thing to you, something else in Bulgaria, something third. So we say deposits. Ah, deposits. What kind of deposits? 
No. Checkable deposit is a deposit on which a check can be written. It does not have to be checkable deposit. Moreover, banking has existed for hundreds of years, let's say since 13 or 1400s in Venice, right, in Genoa and whatnot, and the check was not really familiar or known back in those old days. How do we call these deposits? Same kind of Demand, demand, demand. That's the key word. Demand deposit is a deposit which can be withdrawn on demand. So the key word for a deposit is withdraw. What's the difference between the demand and the checkable deposits? All right, so a checkable deposit is a demand deposit on which a check can be written. So it's a demand deposit also with a checkbook. But the requirement is no checkbook is not a requirement. The demand is the requirement. So it may have a check, it may not have a check. The check is irrelevant. What is relevant is the following. Can you walk in the bank, go to the teller and say, I want my money back. They say, well, you have $9,000, you say, I want it all now, now. What does it mean now? In English, it is called on demand. On demand means you can walk in at any point in time, you can take it all. And they have, here's the key, the legal obligation, the contractual obligation to pay it all immediately, all right? So, demand deposit. So, a bank now, Bank is a really bad word. We always have to say commercial. Commercial bank, because we also have investment banks and other banks and development and all that. So a commercial bank is a financial institution which makes commercial loans and offers demand deposits. This one is strictly required, and this one is strictly required, and if one of them is not true, then it is not a commercial bank. It is something else. For example, you have financial institutions which take deposit and make only real estate loans, mortgage loans we call those. These are not commercial banks, all right? The, we, these we sometimes call savings and loan associations or what. I mean, I don't want to get into the details. I mean, sometimes they're called even mortgage banks, all right? So this is what a commercial bank is. So a financial institution is actually any institution which provides financial intermediation. So this is the broadest one. So what we need is in English called depository institution. So a depository institution is any institution which offers demand deposits. Alright? So it satisfies only two and what else it does is irrelevant. So you have a lot of different depository institutions, alright? Well, they also have investment and blah blah, blah different types. But the depository institution is an institution which accepts demand deposit. All right, so let's try to introduce, it's coming a little bit later. Uh, let's clarify now deposits and state clearly the two main types of deposits. The first main type of deposit is known as demand deposit. Occasionally they call it the site deposit. The second one is known as time deposit. In Europe, for some strange reason, most of the European banking system completely incorrectly calls it a term deposit. Term deposit does not exist. There is no such term. But a lot of Eastern European banks, they use it. They use it because they are Greek banks. In Greeks, not knowing well English, they call it the term deposit because they translate it from English, from Greek into English. They call it the term deposit. There's no term deposit. Term deposit is not defined. It doesn't mean anything. 
time deposit is your term. Now, the other reason a lot of banks in Bulgaria use term deposit incorrectly is because they're owned by Austrian banks. And Austrians in Austria have their own term in German, but when they translate it in English, they translate it in German. So if you develop a culture where something bad begins to propagate and begins to take over a whole continent without critically thinking about what it is, what it means, and other stuff. All right, so this is a time deposit. Time deposit simply, uh, you know, that provides the right to withdraw your deposit only after a specific uh, period of time has already elapsed and that period is defined. So, you have one, one month time deposit, two month time deposit. You cannot withdraw it before that legally. Now, a lot of banks will offer the service for a penalty to give you the money sooner. But this is only a service and an option offered as a courtesy to customer, but there is no legal requirement. You cannot demand your money, then say, well, you know, we don't have to give your money. Again. Well, you still have 15 more days to go. So a lot of banks in the world actually practice that they will honor it, but certainly not. Now, here is a distinction which in Bulgaria, Bulgarian banks love to play because they play regulatory arbitrage. I don't want to get into that. Is where they actually offer strictly legally demand deposits. <coughs> At any point in time, you can walk in and demand it, and they must return it. But they offer it as a 30-day term deposit. Because it's not a term deposit, but they call it term deposit. So if you hold it for 30 days, you get a very high interest. If you hold it for less than 30 days, you get zero interest. All right. So this is a, effectively what they're trying to do is to do a hybrid, but they want to use the concept of a demand deposit for business purposes and the, the other concept for regulatory purposes. So they, they're gaming the regulatory system. So you know, I don't want to get into that anyway. All right, so back to where I was. Certificate deposit is essentially a time deposit in a depository institution, usually a commercial bank, but certainly not necessary for any deposit. And this is the financial instrument which evidences, it's just a piece of paper which provides evidence for a time deposit. The difference is, wow, I got you guys in deep trouble here. Beginning to explain a lot more concepts than I need, but uh, let's get you educated. Uh, negotiable. And non-negotiable. Okay, this is good stuff you have to know anyway. Alright, so negotiable financial instrument is a financial instrument that can be sold and bought. That can be sold and bought. So, is a financial instrument whose title of ownership can be transferred to somebody else. So, ability to transfer the title makes an instrument negotiable. The mere fact that the law allows to transfer it means that the law allows it immediately to be bought and sold. So, for a negotiable, we think of it as one which can be bought or sold, but legally is the one whose title may be transferred. Non-negotiable is an instrument which title cannot be transferred. Therefore, if I have a time deposit and a time deposit is non-negotiable, I cannot transfer it to you. I mean, I can't, meaning sell it to you. All right? I have to use something other. Now, if it's a CD, if it's a CD, CD is a negotiable instrument. So, time deposit is non-negotiable. CD is the negotiable instrument which represents a time deposit. With a CD, means, number one, I can sell it to you. I have a piece of paper, it is due in 90 days, it's a 90 day maturity, I bought it yesterday, and today I realized that I need the money, I cannot and 
man from the bank the money. And the bank won't return it usually. But I can sell it to you, you, or anybody else, whoever will offer me the money. So number one, I can use the instrument to sell it. Number one, I can use the instrument as a security for something else. I can use the instrument, and I'm coming next, into a repo to, for a repurchase agreement. In other words, I have the ability to do everything else I want to do. Everything that can be possibly done with a negotiable instrument. Questions? Yeah. Uh, CD, CDs are time deposits. And time, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. And time deposits are non-negotiable. So how can a CD be a negotiable? No, 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 no. C okay, that's what I'm explaining now. CD is the negotiable version of a time deposit. So time deposit is not negotiable. But as soon as a time deposit, they give you the piece of paper, which is the CD, it becomes negotiable. All right. So people always prefer to have the CD instead of the time deposit because the time deposit they are locked up and can't do anything with the CD they have all the rights that they can do they can mortgage it, they can deposit it, they can do anything else they can walk into another bank and actually take a loan against it and use it as a security for another loan here's another interesting stuff when I was back in the old days in the US we had a few uh, Bulgarian girls that were uh, interesting in developing credit history get some money the US regulator the law immigration law requires them to have twenty thousand dollars in a deposit in a bank deposit in order to issue them a special student visa. You want to have a student visa? Show me the money. That's what the law says. Well, they don't have the money, but they're going to show it. How do they show it if they don't have it? Huh? Loan. Number one, they got a little bit of money, $5,000, way which is not enough to, to show it. They use the $5,000 and they get a certificate of deposit in the bank, all right? So they get a certificate of deposit in the bank, now they get a certificate of deposit, and they go to the next bank and borrow $5,000 more. You know, they borrow $5,000 against the CD. Well, now what you have is a CD in the one bank and a $5,000 loan. Well, what do you do with a $5,000 loan that you just got from the bank? You deposit it in the You get yourself another CD and deposit the next. So you begin a chain reaction where I have $5,000, get a deposit, borrow against it. Now we use the cash to get a second CD, borrow against it, use the cash, the proceeds, we call it, for another one, and you repeat it as many times as necessary to come up with the necessary amount. Use it in a chain reaction. They become a domino, all right? So you're using a domino effect, which is very common on Wall Street, and once you create the dominoes, all you need is a little problem anywhere in the domino, kind of like a chain effect, and suddenly the whole pyramid collapses. So this is how pyramids are based, but it's a different topic altogether. your question. Uh, the room, the uh, does it, uh, can we sell it in the secondary market? Yes, there is. That's what I define it. You may not sell it because you cannot transfer it to him. He's got to be plain stupid to pay you any money if legally it's yours and it can never be his because the law says that you cannot transfer it to him. He can never become legally the owner. Because the law says you can't. If the law says you can't, then it's negotiable. Alright? So no one will pay even one penny for something that could never be theirs because the law says it can never possibly be theirs. All right, so back to certificate deposit is a negotiable uh, instrument. The next one is commercial paper. So commercial paper is a financial instrument issued by a business or a corporation for commercial purposes, for business, for trade purposes. Usually, oh, it is always a short-term instrument of maturity of less than 12 months. So, the difference between certificate of deposit and commercial paper is that certificate of deposit is a liability of a financial, meaning depository institution, 
and the commercial paper is a lie. We look at a commercial business. All right. That's pretty much it. Nothing interesting. The next one D is bankers' acceptance. This is tricky to remember because it, the name is misleading. Bankers' acceptance is a liability of a commercial enterprise, is a liability of a business. So it is an instrument which is issued by a commercial business, which is a promise to pay within certain terms, blah, 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 and has been, we call it, accepted by a commercial bank. The acceptance of a commercial bank is in the form of, has the economic meaning of insurance. Insurance. Insurance means that the bank guarantees that if the commercial business does not pay on time and in full, we call it a finance default, if the business defaults, the bank will satisfy the liability completely and in full. And it becomes the bank's liability, and if the bank does not satisfy, the bank could be liable and forced into bankruptcy. All right, so it becomes a so this is this is a classic insurance policy a guarantee. All right, uh, is it guys getting time? Well, I haven't covered anything. Yes. Uh, what's in the text? Euro dollars. Are we? Take Are we? No. No. All right, let's pause the the camera. All right, we continue with another lecture today. Euro dollars, which is a. Deposit, this is the key, deposit, is a deposit at a foreign bank, so we call it a foreign denominated So it's a foreign denominated deposit. Right now I have Euro dollars, Euro dollars in Samba, which is the local commercial bank, and I have actually Euros in my account. Not a whole lot of Euros, but Euro. So this is for a local bank, for a local bank, it is a deposit in a foreign currency. Euro does not mean that it, it, the currency is Euro. Euro means foreign. foreign currency. It's very important distinction. Very early on, the terminology simply was developed when you had dollar deposits in Europe, which were London deposits. Uh, and, you know, uh, this was associated again another regulatory arbitrage where the uh, United States government interest rates were rising, blah, 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 and commercial banks couldn't pay very high interest on dollars. And suddenly, the euro dollar deposit was invented because, oh, you can get 3% of interest in the United States, but you can get 6% interest in London. So, you don't want to deposit your money in New York, you're going to deposit your money in London. So that's how originally the euro dollar started. So yeah, dollars in Europe. That's what it meant. In other words, in a foreign currency. And over time, the concept has evolved to apply for yen, to apply for all other uh, currencies. All right. So it's fairly straightforward. Now, there are lots of variations. I don't want to get into discuss. Next one is repo. Repo is also very often shortened as RP and stands for repurchase agreement. Repurchase agreement. So a repurchase agreement is a sale, legally and technically it is a sale a particular bundle of securities, usually treasuries, but not necessarily, is a sale 
of a bundle portfolio of securities with an agreement to buy back at a later time, to buy back at a later time for a fixed price, for a fixed price. So, you have a sale price, you have a buy price, and the buy back price is always higher than the sale price. The difference between the two is the spread, again a different type of spread, and represents the income of the other side. Whoever first bought it and then sold it at a higher price, and for the first person it represents a cost or an expense. Yeah, technically it's a gain versus loss, I don't want to get into that. Usually the repo is most commonly practiced in the world as overnight. Overnight, not necessarily. Yes, possibly Fed funds, but it's a different which I'm coming to. Overnight means that it's only for one day occurs. I'm going to sell it to you today and I'm going to buy it back tomorrow. The economic meaning, the economic interpretation of a repo is a short term loan secured by those securities, by the portfolio. So it's a secured short term loan with high grade or investment grade securities, usually treasury bonds. So it is that of a borrowing and lending is the economic meaning, but the legal meaning is technically a purchase and a sale, actually a sale with a repurchase. So, repo is you first sell and then repurchase, and then you have the opposite, reverse, reverse, sometimes pronounced as reverse, reverse the repo, is the opposite. In a repo, you first uh, sell, and then, no, no, for a repo, for, so for a repo, you first uh, sell it, and then you buy it back, here you buy, and then you sell it. Usually, for the one party, it's a repo, for the other party, it's a reverse repo. Alright, then you have F. Let's see if there's anything key or important. Alright. Let's uh, let me, before I finish there is a so-called term repo. Alright, let's see how they define uh, term repo is identical transaction but usually denominates 30, sorry, designates 30 plus days. So a repo potentially could be 30 days. 60 days could be one year. Legally, there is no restriction. In the real world, it's used mostly as overnight, but it's perfectly possible to have one month loan. No big deal. One month or two months or three months. When you do this, you call it to return repo. Alright? Does that play? make sense? Alright, so now we get to F. Let's do, uh, let's clean up. Hmm? Hmm? Oh, okay, e, no, this is uh, e, e, okay, yeah, yeah, that's my mistake. This one here is F. This one is F, and now I'm getting to G. You guys, when you see an obvious mistake like this, just alert me. So, a commercial bank 
will provide a broker loan to a broker. Broker will be securities broker, all right? And the securities broker will use the money for what? Will use the money to lend it to its own customers, to its own retail or other business customers. And the customers will use the proceeds from the loan to buy securities on margin. So, uh, the broker at any point in time can call the margin. We call this a margin call. In other words, he can issue a margin call to its retail customer. And the retail customer, when he gets the margin call, has two options. He's got to put up the cash within so many days, typically three days by law, or he must be sold out of his position for the amount of the margin call, all right? So, why is the broker doing this? The broker is doing this to protect himself against a, you know, a call by his banker, all right? So, investment bank loans the money to the broker and the broker loans it to the retail clients. When the banker calls the loan from the broker, the broker either has the cash or the broker calls the money from the retail customer, all right? So, we call this call loan, which means that the loan is callable at any point in time. And we call it broker because it's given to a broker, all right? Usually, it's a short-term loan. Technically, it's actually a demand loan, a loan on demand. So, it may last for a day, it may last for a week, it may last for a year, it may last for three years. But at any point in time, the banker says, I want my money back. The broker is legally required, I think within 24 hours, I want to get into the legal details, required within a very short period to return the money at any point in time. Well, there's still customer who didn't pay the loan. Huh? If there's a retail customer, he didn't pay the loan for the broker. So, what is responsible? Okay, so uh, first of all, legally, the broker is always responsible for his money, for, for, for his loan. But the point is, the broker should never allow the retail customer not to be able to pay. You have to understand, when the broker gives the money to the retail customer, the retail customer does not take the money, does not have possession of the money. All the retail customer do is buy IBM stock or whatever, let's say crude oil on margin, use it on margin, it's called margin loan is called, and the money sits with the broker himself. So the customer does not see the money, does not have access in the sense of getting it in cash. All he can do is either keep them in his account or use them to buy securities which will stay deposited in this particular account. So, at any point in time, the broker has the securities and he can, we call it, sell out the customer. He can sell out the customer. Alright? In other words, at any point in time, if he doesn't have the cash, he sells out as many securities as necessary and gets the cash. That's all. The only risk that the broker runs is that the value of the securities crashes in a short period, usually one day, crashes to the point where the value of the securities is below the margin low. All right? All right, so that's a broker call. All right, next, E, F, G, what's the next letter? H, Fed Funds. Alright, so let's clarify, Fed Funds is very confusing to a lot of people. Fed Funds is a deposit at of a commercial bank at the central bank, at the Federal Reserve. So, Fed Funds is a liability of the central bank, of the Federal Reserve, and is an asset of a commercial bank. So it's a commercial bank asset, central bank liability. Fed funds is a demand deposit. The bank can have the money at any point in time from the Federal Reserve. It's a demand deposit 
and it is usually used to satisfy minimum reserve requirements. So, usually you keep the money at the central bank and the central bank counts those money as minimum reserve requirement. Let's clarify again what's a minimum reserve requirement. This is a percentage required by a commercial bank from all of its deposits to keep available in reserves, which means cash or deposit of the central bank, to keep it available. So, commercial bank has a total of demand deposits of $100 million. If the minimum reserve requirement is 10%, the commercial bank must keep 10% of 100, which is $10 million, part in cash, part in but the central bank. Sometimes the key question is you have a treasury note, does the treasury bill, does it count as a reserve or not? So usually a law specifies very clearly what counts as a reserve and what doesn't count as a reserve. So this is what Fed funds are. All right? Uh, it's not a law between two commercial banks. No, no, this is different. This is now you may have, you may possibly have a loan. I'll explain this. So you have what is called now Fed funds market. You have a Fed funds market. This is a market where federal funds are traded. So commercial bank A and commercial bank B. I have Fed funds and you know commercial bank A and commercial bank B wants them or needs them. I have more than I need and he needs some of my Fed funds. I can loan in my Fed funds to the next commercial bank. So this is a market where Fed funds are loaned, borrowed and lent from one commercial bank to another commercial bank. The asset is good right? Okay, we, we get to this now. The asset Okay, these usually are excess reserves. So, now, what, you got to understand, it's, it's a very simple concept. The concept is, it's simply a deposit of the Fed. That's all it is. So, all we do is we trade it. Now, the question is, why would we want to trade it? Why? And the answer is one of the most common reasons to trade it, mean to loan each other Fed funds, is to satisfy minimum reserve requirements. So, if I have more re re uh, reserves than I'm required, the difference we call it excess reserves. I don't have to keep my excess reserves, I'm not required to keep it. If someone else has less reserves than is required, she must borrow it from somebody else. So I will loan my excess reserves to the other bank. So this is a market in the market, on the market trade the participants are only commercial banks. Well, the Federal Reserve could also participate, but one bank loans its excess reserves to another bank. But it's, it loans the Fed funds, but it's just a deposit. All right, it's just a deposit of the central bank. That's why I'm saying it's confusing. And then you have the so-called Fed funds rate. And Fed funds rate is short for Fed funds interest rate. And the Fed funds interest rate is the interest rate which one commercial bank charges another commercial bank for borrowing Fed funds. Huh? Yeah, no, for borrowing Fed funds. You know, but now, once you get into loans, it's becoming complicated. This is Fed funds, and I borrow it from you. Uh, you got to understand because once you get to think in those general terms, uh, your thinking becomes muddy. You know, you don't know what is what, you don't know, you don't have the correct and proper thinking, and if you can't, you know, you don't have the proper terms, you cannot think properly. Once you can't think properly, the next step is you cannot analyze properly and things go from bad to worse. So you got to know what is exactly what if you will have proper analytical framework. 
So all we do is I have some debt funds and I like lend it to you. I lend it three percent interest. This is the debt funds rate. It's the living interest rate. Huh? It's the living interest rate. Well, well, you see, you see, you see, you see, you see. Now you're knowing a lot more. You know, again, it's the leading. Well, why are leading? Why are lagging? You know, you know, begin to talk about irrelevant stuff like the sun is rising. Oh no, now the sun is falling. It's 12, uh, 12, 10. I mean, is it right? This is irrelevant. We just say, what is what? That's all we're trying to do. Once you get into leading and lagging, you get into a whole different science, which is way beyond you and me. Let's just say, what is what? This is pig, let's describe the pig. Then this is a hen, let's describe a hen. Then I have a bull, let's describe a bull. We're not trying to say, you know, how big they grow up. All the other things will get a little later. Then you have Libor market. Libor market. Uh, H-I. So I should have probably used numbers here. I. Libor is sometimes pronounced as LIBOR is London Interbank Offered Rate. London Interbank Offered Rate. This is the interest rate which commercial banks charge each other for term loans. Could be one month rate, could be three month rate, could be six month rate. In other words, Usually, the Fed funds, usually one of the key characteristics of Fed funds is that it is overnight. Overnight, alright? So, it is an overnight interest, alright? This is also known as the overnight rate. LIBOR is usually the interbank, it will be sometimes, well, very often for one month, then three, six, possibly nine, possibly. So the whole bank in the world should admit for this rate? Hmm? The whole other commercial bank in the world should admit for this rate? Okay, they should not admit. No one has to. I'm not required in them. There is no law telling me that I should. There is no law telling Samba that it should. Many commercial banks would agree and would like to use it. And they have agreed to use it because it is convenient, because it's a good market rate. Well, that was incorrect. Because it was convenient, it was a good market rate. Over the last 12 months, they have been huge, I mean huge corporate banking scandals in London because the LIBOR was no longer a good market rate between banks. LIBOR was fixed. It was manipulated by bankers for their own interest, so rather than present and report the true rate, they manipulated in such a big way to serve their own interest. Alright? <laughs> so, the LIBOR rate, which is reported by the Bankers Association in London, got totally corrupted to the point where a lot of people believe that in 2009 it is relatively worthless. Well, a lot of contracts have been still fixed to the LIBOR and they still have to perform according to the LIBOR. So, usually, you have a mortgage in the United States, your mortgage will be variable rate, it's going to be LIBOR plus 4. If it's LIBOR plus 4, if they report 3%, you got to use LIBOR 3. If they report 6, you got to use 6. So, as long as LIBOR was representing a true, genuine, market clearing rate, it was great. Now, it's manipulated because it does not represent the market rate, it represents what is 
politically correct, to serve the political interest of the government, and the inherent interest of the bankers that are involved, because sometimes they'll have the interest the rate to be overreported and another times to be underreported. People have lost trust in the Libor. It is extreme, it's still extremely important, but it's losing its value and significance because people are losing trust in it. Alright, questions? Yes, sir. This is an instrument. Hmm? Market instrument. Sorry? Libor. Is it an instrument? Uh, uh, Libor is actually, technically, it is the intermarket that Libor is actually, we got to be clear, there is a Libor market. Libor market. This is where uh, commercial banks meet to borrow and lend to each other for these periods. Then you have the LIBOR rates, LIBOR rates, which is the interest rates which commercial banks charge to each other on the market. And then you have the LIBOR, which is the loan, the same, it's presenting the instrument itself, which is you know, the borrowing and lending, all right? So, LIBOR represents the market where they're traded, they trade the loan itself, and this is the price, all right? The rate represents the price. Is this clarifying? No. Huh? Well, LIBOR, you have a market. This is where you trade, it's on the London. This is the rate, the interest rate at which you trade. So this tells you, uh, and this tells you what you trade. So this tells you the loan. So usually I will be loaning you. So, so this is this is the interest rate at which very big commercial banks lend to each other for a particular period of time. Usually three months LIBOR is one of the key interest rates which a lot of other instruments are fixed to. Alright, based on LIBOR, you have the European equivalent, which is uh, becoming very popular, very well known as the Euribor. So, this is again what European, usually, actually, any bank will charge each other, when one commercial bank will charge another commercial bank for loans, term loans in Euro, alright? So one month Euro, three month Euro, etc. Alright, so what you have now is, the next concept is the uh, section is getting... G. Hmm? No, 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 no. It's, it's no more, no more instruments. No more instruments. Now, what we have is the concept of risk premium. So, what you have is the so-called uh, risk-free, risk-free rate. So risk-free rate is the interest rate which is charged on risk-free loans. At this point, the only risk-free loan is considered to be the treasury loan. So the risk-free rate is considered to be short-term risk-free rate is the interest rate charged on treasury bills. All right. All other instruments will have some inherent risk. It may be one in a hundred, it may be one in a thousand, it may be one in a million, but there will be some risk, whatever that might be. So, whatever the risk is, the compensation for that risk is known as a risk premium. So, the risk premium is the additional, rate, uh, the additional interest rate added on top of the risk-free interest rate to compensate for the risk of a particular instrument. Alright? There is a general relationship coming from portfolio theory, which is natural, that 
the higher the risk of an instrument, the higher the risk premium. This is fairly straightforward. All right, uh, we still have plenty of time, right? Let's move on to the section number two, the bond market. So this all represented the money market. So far, all we did was cover about ten different instruments with some related concepts. And now we do the bond market. So we have uh, chapter two, section two, bond. Market. All right, so usually the bond market is associated number one, long term. Long term defined as maturity of over one year. What if it's uh, short term? The answer is you're in the world of money market instruments. These we call long term, and these are also known as capital market. Capital market, and respectively, capital market instruments. That's number one. Number two, the bond market has the characteristic of debt. All right, we already covered this in one of our first lecture, and therefore, it is well known as fixed income. Income. Uh, let me repeat from last time, fixed income does not mean that the interest rate is fixed, does not mean that the yield is fixed, it only means that it is predetermined beforehand. It may vary, but it's predetermined. Maybe LIBOR plus 4%. So LIBOR may vary, but it's always LIBOR plus 4. Alright, let's see what we have now. We have a whole bunch of them. So let's try to yes, try to use this one. Two, two, one. So section chapter two, section two. The first one is treasury notes. So it becomes uh, treasury notes and bonds. All right, let's clarify. No, 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 stocks is equity. Stock is equity. It's a completely different world. Maybe section 2, 3. Stock. This is not the one. Look, look, look. You guys, uh, there are lots of, there are derivatives, there are futures, there are options. So, right now, stay focused. We're talking about bonds and bonds only. You know, we can ask and talk about picks. Are you interested? No. Right now, we want to do and cover bonds. You got to understand what bonds are, all right? Then we'll move to cows, all right? Or to some other animal. Right now, we're doing so-called animal kingdom. So each animal, you got to understand what it is and how it works, all right? In the different types. So, treasury note and bond. So the first characteristic is that... Notes is from one to ten years. One to ten years. One to ten years of maturity. All right. We're just going to clarify what is what, what it means, how it's interpreted. You know, uh, we're not concerned. I mean, we just want to study the solar system, Earth, Mars, all right, the Moon. Uh, you're telling me, yeah, there's some other constellations. Yeah, I know, but we want to study this. Bonds are ten plus. So you got to remember, Treasury bill. Less than one year. Treasury note, one to ten. Treasury bonds, ten plus. All right, let's see what we have. They are known, also shortened as T note and T bond. All right, they are shortened. This is just an alternative name for treasury note and treasury bond because it's short, it's quick, it's easy. Let's see. Uh, they have. Uh, also, coupon. So, coupon is the 
payments, which is regular payment of income for a bond, is known as interest. Most commonly, every six months. In other words, twice a year. So, we call coupon is the ability to get a payment. From there, you get coupon payments. Coupon payments. You can also get coupon rates. Rate. The coupon rate is the percentage which the coupon pays from the from the face value. So now you have the concept of face value, which is the same as the par, which is the same as the nominal, but it is also known for a bond as principal. Notice that it's spelled A L principal. All right. So principal represents the face value of a bond. So principal is the amount which is payable at maturity, excluding the accrued interest. All right. Or sometimes it's the originally borrowed money, but that may be different from the market price. I don't want to get into the details now. All right. So now you have the concept of yield to maturity. Yield to maturity. So, this is the interest rate or the rate of return which the security will provide or deliver if you hold the security until maturity. maturity. So, whatever the price is, whatever the price is today, you just simply hold it till maturity and ignore the market price fluctuations of the bond because you know the price today and because you know the end value, the end value is thousands and you know all interest payments. In other words, because the cash flow is completely determined and you have the current market price, when you equate the current market price to the discounted cash flow, the rate of discount, the rate of discount which equates the current market price with the cash flow, discounted cash flow, is called yield to maturity. This is the same concept as internal rate of return. This is identical economic financial meaning of the internal rate of return. If you buy it today and hold it to maturity and ignore the market fluctuations, in other words, you ignore the market price throughout the life. You consider only the market price today and the face value or the principal payable on maturity plus all interest rates which are predetermined by the coupon rate. All right? The coupon payment is the cash flow. It's a bit confusing. Confused what? No, no, no. Face value is the amount payable on maturity. One thousand dollars. That's it. The coupon rate is seven percent. This is kind of like the rate of return, but not necessarily. All right. And the coupon payment will be seven. Seventy dollars is seven percent of one thousand. So this will be dollar one thousand. But the problem is, if you're getting confused, you should know this from elementary finance. You know, you see, your background is too poor. Yeah. So I'm clarifying. Face value. This is the amount you borrowed originally, one thousand. The coupon rate is seven percent, as an example, and the coupon payment is seventy. That's all. Now the current market price may be thousand. Maybe 1100, maybe only 900. When you wait to get the internal rate of return from the current market price, you get the yield to maturity. You have to go through your introductory finance. I cannot teach 
all over again what you missed. All right? You started it, correct? You have a good understanding. All right? You have to catch up. It's your own responsibility. I can't hold a whole class uh, because of that. So, 2-2-1. Two, two, then you have 2-2-2. Two, two, two. We call it Federal Agency Debt. Federal Agency Debt. Alright, so these are obligations, usually bonds, issued by federal agencies or financial institutions backed by the federal government, sometimes with an explicit guarantee, sometimes with an implicit guarantee, that in case of default, the federal government will make good on the promise. These are, and I'm just going to read some of them, FHLB, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginnie Mae, FLMC, etc. The two biggest and most important are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Alright, I don't want to... Fannie Mae is the biggest, is the giant, is the big one which was at the core of this whole credit bubble, the real estate bubble, the crisis and everything else. Fannie Mae was instrumental in it. Well, there are some other institutions like AIG with credit default swap. I don't want to get into that. Let's see what we have. Usually, this debt, because it's guaranteed by the federal government, has one of the beautiful properties of being, number one, low risk. The market... Default risk free. Yes. Oh, no, 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 no. We didn't say risk free. Default risk free. Low risk. It's an extremely low risk. Now, why is it not risk free? The answer is because the debt may be so huge that the government will not be able to make good on it. In other words, is it possible that Fannie Mae gets or becomes bigger than the U.S. government? The answer is yes. It is already bigger. All right? So, you may run the risk that because of this guarantee, the market, you know, you have a moral hazard where the agency over-issues liabilities. Two trillion, three trillion, four trillion, where the liability of the agency become bigger than the liability of the government. And if the government has to cover all the liabilities, the government may not have the borrowing capacity to borrow and cover that liability. Usually, let's explain this because it's important. Uh, you know now, Citigroup is in deep, deep trouble. It's almost bankrupt. Well, one of the reasons that it was bankrupt is that the fire, what was it, Merrill Lynch before that? It acquired, was it Tokovia or um, what was the other? Um, Brothers. Uh, the, the other, the subprime lender. In other words, you have a bad financial institution. The typical way to bail it out or to save it is if it's swallowed or acquired by a bigger institution. Well, the problem with financial institutions is that if the bigger institution is undercapitalized itself, and the losses of the small institution are large, and I know a small institution is small, but the profits are large, it may be that the bigger institution is so undercapitalized that the bigger institution itself does not have enough capital to cover the losses of the smaller institution, then technically the bigger institution is itself insolvent and could potentially, due to insolvency, also become illiquid. In other words, a small institution can easily bankrupt the bigger one. This is exactly what we're seeing today. We're seeing that a lot of the bigger institutions which acquired the smaller ones, which were technically not bankrupt, suddenly are in trouble and themselves need a bailout. Well, the problem may be that uh, Fannie Mae is so big that if the U.S. government has to assume all of its liabilities, the U.S. government itself can go bankrupt. All right? It could bankrupt. You say, well, they can always print the money. Yes, they can print the money, but printing the money runs the so-called inflation risk. So, it may be risk-free. 
risk-free in the sense that it's default-free, but it's not risk-free. In other words, you may have the guarantee that it will not default, but it might not default because they print up the money. So there is a trade-off between the default risk and the inflation risk, which is the purchasing power risk. All right, so these were big and instrumental. Then 223 is international. International, yes, bonds, because we're looking only at the bond market. All right, so international bonds, well, these are bonds which are issued on the so-called uh, international capital markets. An example will be a Bulgarian bank going on the London market and borrowing in British pounds. Going on some European market and <coughs> borrowing in Euro. Alright, so usually you go on a foreign much bigger, much more liquid. Now, bigger and liquid means that the institution will be able to borrow at a lower rate. So, you go on a mid European market, you can borrow cheaply, meaning at a relatively low interest rate. So, you would like to do that. That's the one reason. The other reason is that for a major Bulgarian bank, the Bulgarian capital market is too small for the bank. So, the bank cannot possibly issue a lot of bonds. In other words, it cannot raise the capital that it believes it can raise. So, the bank needs, let's say, 2 billion euro commercial bank. But, let's say, Bulgarian GDP is 20 billion euro. I mean, the, the, the whole reserves, the currency reserves of Bulgaria are made at 10 billion euro, all right? So, if you want to issue 2 billion euro, I mean, 2 billion euro in the government will have difficulties borrowing internally from Bulgarian savings. So, you got to go on the international markets. So, one reason to go on international capital market issue international bond is better liquidity. A second completely different reason is better interest rate. A third different reason is potentially a better match of the currency of denomination with the currency of revenue. You say, well, why are we going to go on the international market? Well, Bulgaria will probably not go on the Japanese market where the, Jap the interest rate is extremely low because the revenues are not driven by the Japanese yen. But Bulgaria is in the European Union and if you're not going to be borrowing in Bulgarian local currency, you might as well borrow in Euro because 90% of Bulgarians' revenues, trade, imports, export, economy, everything, you know, tourism, everything is driven by the European Union and dominated by the Euro itself. So this will provide the lowest possible currency risk based on an economic, you know, the underlying economy. All right, so now we have uh, various bonds called Euro Yen bonds, Yankee bonds, Samurai bonds. You're going to study them, they're not as important for, you know, their data aren't as important. What's important is what is the currency in which the bond is denominated, and number and then what is the currency risk that the bond has. So you must remember. Every bond is always denominated in a currency. So, evaluation for every bond requires, besides all other things, also to provide a currency risk for the weakness of the bond. Next is 224. So, a local government issues bonds to finance itself. 
One of the key concepts here applicable mostly to America, but not very likely applicable to other countries in the world, is that these in the United States are tax exempts. This simply means that the bond uh, revenue from the bond, from the interest on the bond, is exempt from taxes. Except means that the law does not require to pay taxes on that income if you do not have to count that income as taxable income. So that's the number one is key. Now you have two general types. Hmm? Gold bonds. No, that's gold bars? Go, go, bonds. It's project bonds or something. Okay, well let, let's see, let's let's try first one is called General obligation. General obligation means the full faith and credit of the borrower. So you can use any and all resources, you can use any and all revenues, and potentially any and all assets to cover your obligation in case of default. This is considered to be the lower risk. And then you have the higher risk and type, which is, they call it, revenue bonds. Revenue bonds. So these are general obligation bonds. Revenue bond is a bond issued by a local municipality which is backed by or guaranteed by the revenue of a particular project. It could be a road, but well, you've started it, right? Yeah. Apparently so. Uh, All right. Uh, then you have some other known as tax anticipation. Because there is no guarantee. 
So suddenly you thought you had a highly liquid certain security with a certain income which you auctioned for one week and then you expect to be re-auctioned and maybe sell it a week later which can turn out not to be liquid at all and you're totally stuck. And usually these auction rate securities, this is the general concept, are usually municipal bonds. Most often, 99% of the time, are municipal bonds. So the municipality will issue a long-term municipal bond, but investors are not willing to get stuck with a long-term municipal bond, but they're willing to buy it if every week there is an ongoing auction and they re-auction it and they can get it anytime they want to get it or can get rid of it whenever they want to get rid of it. All right? In other words, they kind of like retain their liquidity. How much more time do we have? It's 1 and 25 minutes. One hour. 125. All right, let me see and finish. I should be able to finish very, very soon. All right, so uh, last one. Again, all I'm doing is a survey. You guys are expected to know most of those things. Uh, if not, uh, you will read the details. Sometimes you will study them in corporate finance, in other stuff. For example, corporate bonds. So, 224, 225. Well, let's see. Uh, municipal bonds are four. Okay, 225. Corporate bonds have all the characteristics of a bond. They are issued by a corporation. Let's see what else. They have what we call, usually almost always, semi-annual coupon. This means that there is a payment which is made semi-annually every half year, which means that you get two coupon payments uh, per year. They have standard, usually estimable, we are able to estimate default risk, which I explained last time what it is. Sometimes they will be known as Debentures, which means what? What does it mean, debenture? Security. Yeah, we're talking all day long about this. Of course, it's going to be a big. Yeah, it is unsecured. Unsecured. Of course, they are all securities. But this is a special type of security. It's a security which has no security. All right, so it is unsecured. So, unsecured, let's see if they have a name. Yes. And they will be also. Well, first of all, let's just say secure bonds. So, the ventures are unsecured bonds and have secured bonds. They may be secured with particular revenues, they may be secured with particular assets. In other words, they can mortgage a particular, uh, particular asset. Now, they may be, another category is subordinated. Subordinated means that it has a higher, oh sorry, lower priority amongst bonds. So you may have bonds with higher priority and you may have bonds, bonds with lower priority. So some bonds that will be issued will have a lower priority. If it has lower priority amongst both bondholders, we call it a subordinated bond. It may be also in the category of callable. So callable means that the issuer, the corporation, has the option but not the obligation to call the bond early. In other words, to 
pay off early according to predefined terms in the callability of the bond. And they may be also convertible. Yes, which is a bond that can be converted into stocks at the option of the bond holder. So, you bought the bond and at any point in time, you can convert it for 20 shares of that particular stock. Alright, you also have the interest rate, which we call also the, the yield. So, bonds will have a yield and based on the yield you will get and that's why I emphasized very early on you will get the spread in this particular case the spread is the difference between the yield on the corporate bond and a yield on a government bond of similar or of the same maturity so, 5-year government bond yields 3%, 5-year corporate bonds yield, bond yields 7%, and the difference between the two is the spread of 4%, and we call this the yield, the yield spread. And we're done for today. Alright?